Fall City Christian Church is standing in worship this morning at a safe social distance. Sing to me, yes, I will. Count on one thing, here we go. Well, I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. And you won't fail me now. And in the waiting, the same God is never lame. Is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, and yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing that the same God who never fails will not fail me now and you won't fail me now and in the waiting that the same God who's never lame is working all things out you're working all things out see now yes I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, and yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against and I choose to praise Glorify, glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand against Oh yes, I will lift you up In the lowest valley And yes, I will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy All right, that's better. Ryan's loud guitar. I'm still mad at him. He was at Disney all week last week. True story. Came back with a really cool shirt that I'm jealous of. We missed you. We missed you. We're just waiting on Adam. Just waiting on Adam. Is that me? It's that deeply man voice. That's what that is. It's my voice that I used to say, hey, girl, I see you seeing me seeing you seeing me um anyways i just want to welcome you guys to fall city um 
It's great to be back. Uh, last week, we were a little light, but it seems like things are, are picking up some. Uh, we've got a lot of things going on. Uh, first of all, you can, you can follow us on all the social media mediums like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and the website, which is fallcitychristian.com. Um, also, uh, right now, uh, we just kicked off volleyball season, church volleyball season. We have two teams. One team played uh, last Monday night, and evidently they're just super awesome. Um, I wasn't there, but uh, we are going to have a second team. So uh, if you are interested, uh, come play, come hang out with us, and then also we'll keep you uh, updated on when our two teams are going to play each other because that's going to be a big deal. There's going to be lot, lots of monies. Lots of monies lost uh, for the people who... November 2nd. November 2nd. It's on like the break of dawn, okay? So, and speaking of break of dawn, we're going to break of dawn's team whenever we play them. <laughs> so, um, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Anyways, um, make sure to check us out on Facebook. Also, if you aren't, uh, if you aren't here right now and you still want to... Um, Give your tithes and offerings. You can do that by texting the amount to 84321. Uh, as far as communion and offering, it's still in the back. You go uh, grab it whenever you want. Drop your offering off, and uh, then uh, we can take that both individually and collectively uh, at, the, at the proper times. Also, if uh, you are interested in getting involved, just uh, taking a next step, getting involved on a deeper level, maybe uh, in our children's ministry, our students' ministry, or in, in the media, in, in really any way, uh, come find me. Uh, come find one of our leaders, one of the people that you know that are involved so that we can, um, so that we can help you along taking your next step. Um, Anything else? If you have any announcements for the bulletin, uh, let me know. And, uh, oh, fill out the little Terry Offie thingies if uh, you need anything, just so we can reach out to you. Welcome, and let's continue. This song's pretty special. It's called This We Know first time we ever held a meeting as Fall City Christian Church, we played this song. In the bridge it says, we trust you, we trust you, in all things we trust you, that your ways are higher than ours. Knowing that it was like three years ago, to see where God's taken us, how many people we've been able to help through this church, and what the future holds is super exciting. We're going to continue to trust him with our lives, with this church, and with this song. Let's lift him up. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. And our hope is in you alone. And our strength in your mighty name. And our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus yes, we know. and this we know we will see the enemy run this we know we will see the victory come and we hold on Every promise you ever made, Jesus, you are unfailing. And our guide through the wilderness, our joy in the heaviness, and our way when it seems there is no way. Jesus, we know. 
sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We eat the bread that represents the body that was broken. We drink the cup that represents the blood that was poured out. The blood of a new covenant, of a new promise, a new promise of everlasting love, a new promise to let us know that above all, God is, and God is in control Despite what we're going through, despite the social unrest, despite any physical ailments, despite the political climate, amidst everything, God is in control. There's been unrest in our world since the fall of man. And today is no different. But scripture says that God is love. And that's where our hope lies. Our hope lies with him, the one that poured it all out on the cross for our sins, that offered his life as a perfect sacrifice so that our sin debt could be paid and covered. Scripture says that he calls us his sons and daughters, that he blesses us. We're like quivers, we're like arrows in his quiver. He holds us close. And he portrayed that when he went to the cross and sent his son. Because even at that moment when his son was dying on the cross, God was in control. And he knew this had to happen so that we could have an eternal, everlasting, fulfilled life with him. 
the Son be an example of how we should live and love. God's in control. And God continually blesses us. As we sing, this is your time to worship with communion, to honor him with tithes and offerings if you haven't already, and just to lift him up and thank him for who he is, to thank them that he is in control. It's your time. God, we just thank you so much for giving this, for giving all. It's in Jesus' name. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And
and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your clothes With everything, with 
Uplifted hearts, we give it all to you. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was and is and is to come. God, I pray that we're pleasing in your sight, that you'll say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in and join the party. There's room at the table for you. Thank you so much for allowing us to worship freely. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that gave it all for our sins. Pray that you be with him as he brings your message. It's in Jesus' beautiful name that I pray. Amen. I'll tell you what, it makes a huge difference when you have a group of people who are willing to put in the work to set the tone, to really kind of create the environment for us to be uh, where we're at um, physically, emotionally, spiritually right now. So I'm extremely appreciative of you guys. Um, it's, uh, it's cool to be able to sit back there and kind of watch all this un unfold. It's, it's really neat from that position, but it's super cool from back there so you can see everybody uh, diving into this. So we are in week two of a series called Masquerade. Uh, like I said last week, I found it fitting because of the whole stupid mask thing, but also it's, uh, it's Halloween month too, so there, it's, it's kind of a, a twofer, if you will, and um, I, I was trying to think about these different masks that we put on, these different, um, these different facades that we put on uh, to hide who we really are or to pretend like we're somebody that we're not, uh, be it because of uh, self-confidence issues or insecurities or fear. And I think fear is the first thing I want to dial in on. Fear is the first thing I want to jump in on. So I've entitled this sermon, Fear Face. 
Um, I don't know why. It just sounded right. It just rolls off the tongue, fear face, right? And uh, uh, fear face is fun because, first of all, I love Halloween. Does anybody else here love Halloween? I love Halloween. It's a blast. For me, um, it's the beginning of the holidays. Like, that's how I kind of measure it. This whole ho- Halloween month, it's the beginning of the holidays. I may even start listening to Christmas music on November 1st. I'm not sure yet. I'm still wrestling with that one. Um, but one of the things I love about Halloween is, is, is getting scared. It's fun to get scared. Anybody? Anybody? It's fun. It makes me... F- it makes me feel alive. Yes, I do. I giggle. As a matter of fact, that's next on my slide, jerk. Um, anyways, um, it is. I, I do. I enjoy haunted houses. Ryan's been to haunted houses with me. We've had a good time, and uh, they do make me have this high pitched giggle um, that is super silly and not very manly at all. As a matter of fact, during the entire month of October, I'm not allowed to drive my Jeep because of the silly uh, giggle. Um, it's, it seems uh, like every year, though, do, does anybody like going to the Halloween stores? Anybody show of hands? It seems like every year, though, the, the Halloween stores, they just keep, like, upping the ante on the jacked-up stuff that you see. Like, it gets, it gets stupid, right? Like the, the giant clowns that are motion-triggered that reach out to grab you when you walk past it. That's enough to make you pee a little bit, right? <laughs> Same thing with the giant spider that jumps out at you. Anybody ever seen that one or seen the, the video of the, the little girl that steps on the thing and it jumps out and she just hits the floor? It's hilarious. It's awesome. But last year, I took the boys, uh, I think it was in Clarksville, I took the boys to this Halloween store and I saw, like, this is jacked up, y'all, okay? I saw a little girl zombie doll, all right? Doesn't sound too bad, right? But it actually follows you around, okay? I don't know, like, if it was remote controlled or if there's some sort of a sensor or, or, or something. But as I, as I walked up to it, I just walked up to the back of this, this little girl blue dress, um, pigtails, kind of cute. And when it turns around, you got, like, the hideous crazy eyes, and a little bit of blood coming from the mouth and the funky teeth and, and, and all that stuff. Um, it, it gets these crazy eyes and it's got blood run down its face. And I thought, that's funny. <laughs> Until it starts moving toward me. All right. It wasn't funny anymore when it started moving toward me. All right. It was less funny when she started following me. Like if it moves toward me, fine, I get out of the way. But if I'm dodging left or I'm dodging right and that thing follows me left or right, I just punt her across the store. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I didn't punt it across the store. But, but I do want to talk about something that reminds me of, of this, this progression of Halloween stores and their gore and their guts and this newfangled ways of making grown men pee a little bit, you know. Um, because, because I've noticed, I've noticed over the years. Like, I'm a, I was born in the 70s, I'm kind of an 80s kid, and my heyday was in the 90s, and, and I'm kind of this cross between old school, new school vibe. Like, I, I, I was one of those guys that say, I played out in the woods all day without anybody uh, worrying about me. I was one of the kids that got whipped with uh, Hot Wheels tracks and fly swatters, and my mom spanked me with a moccasin once. I don't know what that was all about. I didn't even know we were like Native American. It was crazy. But, but I've noticed over the years that culture has kind of done the same thing to us, right? They've, they've, they've upped the ante on this fear factor thing. I'm sure that part of it's because we've got so much uh, information at our fingertips. I said fingertips, no pun intended, Dawn. Um, she hit her fingertip with a hammer and broke her finger. So, um, But uh, the other part of it is I think that fear is marketable. Fear is a cash cow, right? That's why Halloween stores up the ante every year because fear is a cash cow. And I think that the media and politics and culture and society and the world is kind of bought into that, right? Uh, the ones who can produce and deliver fear are typically the ones who are in control over the ones who react to it. Does that make sense? The ones who can produce that, who can fabricate that, who can leverage that, 
are typically in control over the ones who react to it. I honestly see an entire nation of people falling into this trap right now. And we think it'll be over in a month. But just like the Halloween stores, there is always a new and improved creepy zombie girl doll just around the corner. Just waiting to chase you. Just waiting to chase you around, make you, make you look stupid in front of your kids, right? <laughs> and so how do we respond to this? It's funny when it's a Halloween store. It's not funny when it's our livelihoods. How do we respond to this? Knowing that there will always be something next, but not knowing the level of shock that comes with it, right? I know there are things, people, situations, and circumstances that, that can hurt me, but that shouldn't keep me from living a life of faith and hope, right? Right? I want to unpack a brief part of a story uh, that most of us are pretty familiar with. Are you guys familiar with uh, David and Goliath? Yeah, most of you. Anybody not hear about David and Goliath? I can give you the, the rundown. Okay, we're good. You just saved yourself like 45 minutes of a sermon. Um, I'm just kidding. Whoever said that was a jerk. But um, there, there's, no, there's no doubt that there's plenty of danger, Right? There's no doubt that there, there's, there's plenty of danger and fear in, in, in this camp right now because David is going to this camp, okay? His dad has sent him with basically cheese pizza to take to his older brothers to the camp because the army is camping out, and they are kind of facing off with the Philistines, right? And here's how David responds. It says this in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says, don't, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Saul replied, "Uh, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. By the way, this dude was almost as tall as a basketball goal. All right, like the rim. Like a regulation-sized basketball goal. Goliath was almost as tall as that. All right? He says, this guy's been a, 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 a man of war since his youth, but David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. Uh, When a lion or a bear comes to to steal a lamb from the flock, I I go after it with a club. Now, that's a little crazy, isn't it? Anybody? Anybody down for that job? Not me. We have rifles now. We don't need clubs, right? (laughs) Um, He says, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth, the most dangerous part of a lion. The most dangerous part of a bear is mouth. And if the animal turns on me, listen to this. I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I bet he doesn't giggle at haunted houses. (laughs) Um, I've done this both with lions and bears, and, and I'll do it again with this pagan Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. He said, and, and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul gave David his own armor. It's a big deal. Like Saul is the king and, and, and one of the most rewarded, awarded, re- one of the best fighters ever, one of the best soldiers ever, okay? Uh, and Saul is giving him his armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. Uh, David put it on, um, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn anything like this. He was your typical middle school boy that ran around in Nike shorts and basketball jerseys, right? He never wore anything like this. Uh, He said, I can't go in these. He protested to Saul. Now, is that offensive? Like, the king gave you his armor. And he's like, nah, I'm good. I'm I'm not used to this stuff. So David took them off again, and he picked up five smooth stones from the stream and put them into his shepherd's bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, He started across the valley to fight the Philistine. 
Like you were just given the most powerful man's in the world armor, okay? And you pick up rocks. It doesn't make sense, does it? You pick up rocks. And so, so there are some things out of this story. I, I want us to kind, of, to kind of mine out of it and take and apply to our lives. The first one is don't be a sis. Like don't be a sis bag, okay? David wasn't a sis bag, was he? He's like, if a lion comes and steals one of my dad's sheep, I'm going to grab it by the jaw and club it to death. I don't think he's a cis bag, right? And, and, and I say this, I say this um, because sometimes we hear something or we see something on TV and, and our immediate action is to what? To tuck tail and run. And for too many decades, the church has seen things in the world and it scared them. You know what they do? They take this church building and they use it as a bunker. And they hide from everything. And, and, and they judge people from there. You know what that is? That's being a cis bag. We hide from anything and everything that may be hard, troublesome, or dangerous. And we do it out of fear. For some, it's fear of losing their stability, right? For some, it's fear of losing their wealth or their health or their life or position in certain social circles. So when we play it safe, fear is the giant that is in the presence of our lives, right? Fear is that giant that's staring at us and, 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 and mocking us. Fear is that giant. If we don't face some of these fears in our lives, and if we don't take next steps of our faith, well, then we end up like this Israelite army, right? David shows up thinking that he's just bringing food to his brothers, and he sees thousands of cowards thousands of cowards check this out it says the the philistines now mustered their army uh, for battle and camped between soco which is i'm assuming the town where southern comfort was made um, in judah and uh, azica at ephes uh, demim or something like that um Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the Valley of Elah. So the, so the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail. It weighed 125 pounds. That's a middle schooler, y'all. Like, his jacket weighed the same as a middle schooler. He also wore leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. Uh, the, the shaft of the spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. He was probably the safest guy on the field. Because his shield was probably big enough for his armor bearer to just straight up hide behind, right? Goliath stood and, and shouted a taunt across uh, to the Israelites. Why, why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you're only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you'll be ours. I defy the armies of Israel today, he says. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken and giggled with a high-pitched giggle, right? For 40 days. Now, I want you to think about that. For 40 days, like at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, 15 days sucked. Imagine 40 days every morning and evening the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. Not a single person stepped up. 
For 40 days, they cowered in fear. They lived in fear. They, they would go to sleep at night in their tents, maybe sleep, because they don't know if somebody's coming to attack them. Could you imagine how exhausting that must be? Fear caused this nation of people to sit and be yelled at and be demeaned and, and, and taunted and called out for 40 days. I mean, would you endure that for over a month? Guys, it's, it's not like quarantine. They're camping. First of all, that sucks, right? Unless it's like an RV, right? Where you have a heater and air conditioning, at least a 42-inch screen TV, right? And, and just across the valley uh, from the army that wants to kill them. They're, they're getting very little sleep, very little food, and they're constantly looking over their back for the Philistines to come and kill them. This is what fear is causing them to endure. And each day their bully would come out and challenge them, knowing that they were cis bags, right? And regularly, on the regular, twice a day, killing their spirit over and over again. I said earlier that we value our comfort and our stability. Do we not? Yeah, we do. But to what point and at what cost? They, they didn't even give God a thought until one person who had faith came onto the scene. They were more worried about saving their hind ends. Right? They were more worried about their comfort. They were more worried about not being the guy to go fight the giant. And, and they didn't think about God until David comes on the scene. And they even tried to talk him out of it. Why? Because they were owned by fear and they were not living a life of faith and hope. As a matter of fact, they allowed fear to rob that for them. So, so, so what is it in your life? What is it in your life that has been threatening you? that's been taunting you, that's been demeaning you, that's been threatening your livelihood. And by livelihood, I don't mean your 401k, all right? I mean your calling to be more than you have been, to be all that you've wanted to be your entire life, but you've gotten stuck in this comfort trap and you're afraid to lose it. The writer of Hebrews tells us this. He says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Like if your hope is in God, death isn't even something worth being afraid of. It's not. It sounds weird, and I probably don't mean it the way it's going to come out, but it's actually something to be excited about. Because imagine that next adventure that you have when you're face-to-face -face with your Savior. These are, these are two verses built with a ton of punch here. He says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have, right? What does, what does money buy us? What, and, 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 and. And what's the point of our existence? Is it, is it for money? Like, do we live for money? No, I think we earn money so that we can live, so that we can have a, a life, right? Is, is money the point of our existence? Is, like, is the reason that you were created and the reason that you are here on earth, is it to make money? Is it to, is, is it to make yourself as comfortable as you possibly can be? Do you think that God, whenever he wove you in your mother's womb, was like, go get comfortable, y'all. Make that money. This is, this is Doug Kendall. Dollar dollar bills, y'all. Doug Kendall. <laughs> right? I mean, is that why we were created to make money? I don't think it was. As a matter of fact, when God created man and woman, money didn't exist. So we weren't created for money. Actually, money was something we created for us. 
So why were you created? How are you hardwired personally? Why are you created? Uh, what should you be doing? And why aren't you? My guess is fear. Then he goes on to say, don't live in fear. God is A, with you, and B, will never abandon you. He's not like, oh, this is getting a little too crazy for me. I'm out, right? Like, your dysfunction doesn't scare him. He saw it coming. For some of you, everybody saw it coming. I'm just saying, <laughs> right? <laughs> your dysfunction does not scare him. Then you can say, the Lord is my helper, so I don't have to fear. Like, fear doesn't have to eat my lunch. Fear doesn't have to own me. Fear doesn't have to cause me to climb into my tent and cower and constantly look over my shoulder. We cannot sit at camp and be yelled at by our problems and expect to be living our best life. You can't expect that. You don't get both of those. You do not get comfort and living your best life at the same time. Am I right? I just don't think you can. The Israelites were being giant cis bags, just, just cowering to this giant of a problem. Not one person saying, why, why am I here? Not one person saying, well, am I not a soldier? Am I not here to protect my people, am I not here to protect God's people? Until David showed up and he's like, well, why am I here? Well, I thought it was to deliver cheese pizza. This kid who wasn't a sissy, <laughs> who, who, who it leads me to my, to my second and final point. Don't be a sis bag, but also don't be reckless. Like there's a difference there's a difference between being confident in who God is and just being reckless, not putting any thought or purpose into it. Now, David, he wasn't a sissy, and although it seems that he was a bit reckless, he wasn't. Now, if I'm sitting on my couch watching Netflix and I see a reality TV show where a shepherd grabs a lion by the jaw and clubs him to death, that seems reckless to me, right? Right? But he, but he knew what he was doing. He understood the power of God. He understood his uh, abilities and his boundaries. He also saw Goliath for what he was, a big, dumb animal. That's all Goliath was to him, a big, dumb animal, right? Driven by nothing but his appetite. It's why lions do lion crap, right? It's why bears do bear crap, right? Because they are big, dumb animals that are driven by nothing but their appetite. And so he says, he says, don't, don't worry about this Philistine. He's a big, dumb animal, right? I'll go fight him. Saul says, don't, don't be ridiculous. Like, that seems a little reckless, grabbing a lion by the jaw and clubbing it to death. It's a little reckless, David, right? There, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only just, you're just a boy, and, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's animals. And when something threatens what belongs to my father, I grab it by the jaw and I club it to death, Right? I know what's important. I, I've done this with both lions and bears. I'll do it again with this big, dumb animal that's standing in front of us that you have allowed to, to shout you down twice a day for the past 40 days. He's defied the armies of the living God. He says, I've seen this before. I've, I've fought this before. I've conquered this before. It just looks a little different. Instead of looking like a lion or a bear, it's a man. 
and he's just driven by his pride and his appetite. He wasn't reckless. He recognized the situation. That's not reckless. Taking a moment to stop and assess the situation is not reckless. He recognizes it. Not so different from things that he had conquered before. It is, it is actually a, a pretty good use of common sense. How many of us are so reactionary that we don't pause for a second and assess the situation or the circumstance that we're in? And then we get overwhelmed and we overreact. And then we look back on it and we're like, well, that wasn't as bad as it played out in my mind. Which seems to escape a lot of people. Common sense. Whenever they're driven by fear. And, and the kicker, the kicker of, of assessing the situation, saying that's just another big dumb animal, is that he knew who he was and he knew who God was. Right? He knew who he was and he knew who his father was. He has defied the armies of the living God is what he said. He is threatening the lives of, of, uh, that my father cares about. He understood that God wasn't pleased either. God was just waiting on somebody to assess the situation and step in, not be a cis bag, right? He just needs the right weapon to swing. And that came in the form of a little boy with huge faith and a huge amount of hope. Another thing that David calculated was the tools that he would use to get the job done. Anybody ever start like a, a home improvement um, job and not have the proper tools? And then you find other tools that might work just as well, but then it makes a bigger mess and you get frustrated and then you have to hire somebody and it ends up costing you more in the long run. And then your wife hits you. I mean, no. Um, <laughs> Anybody do that? Anybody try and do a job without the proper tools? All it creates is frustration. But he has, he has calculated the tools that he needs to get this job done. It says, then Saul gave David his own armor, uh, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. Uh, David put it on. He, he strapped on the sword over it, and he took a step or two to see what it was like. And he's like, this ain't for me. This ain't how I roll. This might be good for you, but you're a lot taller than I am, and, and your breastplate is smacking me in the shins, and nothing is worse than, than taking a shot to the shin. If you've ever run into a truck hitch, a Reese hitch, then you know that you can't go to war like that, right? He said, I'm not used to them. So David took them off, and he picked up five smooth stones, which sounds ludicrous, Right? from a stream, and he put him into his shepherd's back, his man purse. Like, this is a guy who is putting rocks in his man purse to throw at a giant. It sounds crazy, but he is calculated. Then armed with only a shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. David knew who he was. He knew who God was. He knew how he, knew how he, he fought, and he knew how he couldn't fight. And just because everyone else fought that way, right? Just, just because everybody else had a, a suit of armor, just because everybody else had chain mail, just because everybody else had a breastplate, just because everybody else had a giant sword, doesn't mean that that's how he was going to fight. As a matter of fact, the fact that he didn't fight that way made him who he was. There is something huge about throwing off the armor of Saul. And he said, nah, this is not how God prepared me. I know this is how you guys think I should be prepared, but this is not how God has prepared me. So he picks up some rocks and a stick, which seems stupid, but not when you're a shepherd and not when you've been protecting the flock. Not whenever you know what you're doing with what you're doing it with. And I'd be willing to say if David would have gone out with somebody else's weapons, Goliath would have torn him apart. He'd have been torn apart. And the people would have been enslaved to the Philistines. 
but because David used what he was given. And we're going to talk about this later in this series about insecurity and feeling like you don't add up in comparison. Because David get, used what he was given and didn't allow the fear of what the other soldiers and even the king had to say to dictate who he was. He was the one who conquered the giant. Not the king with the armor. Not the soldiers who had been camping out for 40 days. Right? He was the one who conquered the giant. He was the one who freed the people. He was the one who got to claim the victory in the name of God. While all the others, these soldiers with their armor and their swords, they sat and they lived in fear. And they watched. And the more they watched, the more fearful they became. This event of a, of a young man overcoming fear and fighting with the weapons that he had ultimately led him to the throne. It wasn't long before he wasn't just David, but he was King David. He was the focal point of the bloodline that brought us Jesus Christ. Right? This one defining event that was drenched in fear by the culture that he was in. This fear, but it was overcome by a young man with faith and hope and a freaking handful of rocks. Imagine what God will do in the face of this, this fear culture if you step out with what God has given you and you trust him. It, you may feel like it looks as stupid as a handful of rocks. But what he can do with a handful of rocks is way more than what you could do with anything that you could gather up on your own. You see, fear is a weird thing. There's a balance there. You can't just look and watch and tuck tail and hide in your tents and be a cis bag and think that, that it's just going to go away. But you also can't be so reckless that you, run at it with, that you run at it without stopping and assessing the situation and saying, all right, who am I? More importantly, whose am I? And because of whose I am, what has he given me to fight with? Because what he has given me to fight with is perfect for my fighting style. And if you step out, instead of step back and hide, instead of tuck tail and hide, if you step out in faith and you fight that fear, it won't be long. You'll be standing over top of that giant with its head in your hand. And it won't be long that you'll, you'll experience a freedom that you've never experienced before. But it takes work. And it takes faith. It takes confidence in who you are and who, whose you are. So that mask, that, that fear face, be it that face that says, I know I should be afraid, but I'm not afraid, so I'll just fake it. <laughs> Or that, that face that says, um, I'm really afraid, but i got to pretend like I'm not afraid. No, you just take that sucker head on, and you calculate who God is, you calculate who you are, and you calculate what he's given you. And you go at it, and you will experience victory and freedom. And it will give you and your children, and your children's children, all those generations, an opportunity to do the same when they see that played out in front of their eyes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the fact that you have equipped us to face our giants. And Lord, I, I pray that at this moment we stop living in this culture of fear and we start taking on these giants. Because Lord, when they start seeing these giants fall because of our faith, it's going to free so many people that it's just going to automatically send giants running. 
and that a, a culture of fear will be something of the past and a culture of hope and faith will be what we're walking into. It will be our future. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who did just that, stepped up to the giant of sin and hell and death and knew exactly what he had was exactly what was going to conquer all of those giants. And he laid it out there so that we could experience freedom. Lord, help us to live in that strength, in that power, in that confidence, in that hope, in that victory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great week, guys.